Okay, you guys hear me okay? All right, uh, thanks for coming to this uh, session. Uh, my name is Jordan Nielsen. I'm with uh, Ancestry.com, here with Bryce Walter. Uh, and we're going to talk about what we're doing with OpenStack and Kubernetes. And here's the agenda. Uh, we're actually going to talk just right at the beginning a little bit about Swift. Um, Swift is what kind of set us on our OpenStack path. And so we'll mention a couple things that we're doing with that. And then uh, I'll turn it over to Bryce and he'll talk about our OpenStack implementation. And then we'll, um, and then I'll hand, come back to me and I'll do the Kubernetes uh, piece. And really what we want you to get from this is a takeaway is uh, if you're not doing Kubernetes, how we're doing it, and you can go back and maybe implement some of the things that we're doing, or you can say, well, these guys don't know what they're talking about, and you can go a totally different direction. So one of those two ways uh, should get you uh, where you want to go. So <clears throat> quickly, uh, this, who's heard of Ancestry? Raise your hands. OK. Who uses Ancestry? A few of you. Great. So pretty simple. We're a technology company um, that it has a human mission, and that human mission is just like it says here, to help people discover, preserve, and share their family history. And it used to be that family history was extremely hard, right? You'd have to go to um, libraries and archives and different things like that to actually look up records and even do genealogy. We've made that extremely easy by providing you images and a website where you can go on and search for your ancestors. And when you get in there, it really becomes a meaningful experience because you find, you know, you, you just find all sorts of different things. We have this hinting system where it kind of leads you on this path uh, to find your ancestor. So uh, a plug for Ancestry, and this is my sales pitch. If you haven't used it, go to Ancestry and sign up for a free trial and, and see what you find. So, um, uh, but we have a number of different things. We have a mobile app that you can use. We have our website. And then we have a new, a fairly new product, a DNA product, where you can actually do a saliva swab, send it into us, and we'll process it, send it back, and tell you about your ethnicity, help you get started on your family tree. And that's become a very popular thing uh, that we've come up with in the last uh, two or three years. So anyway, that's a quick overview of Ancestry. So what are we doing with Swift? So we, um, just a little bit of background, we have a data center in Salt Lake. And then our other data center is AWS. So we use Amazon. Um, and so what, we, what started this OpenStack journey is that a few years ago is we didn't have AWS. And we kind of noticed uh, AWS you know, S3 coming out and object storage. And we wanted to implement that in our own data center. And so what we did is we started looking at OpenStack, Swift, and at, at the time we didn't even look at the other components. We just looked at Swift because uh, Swift can stand kind of all by itself. Um, and so, so what we did there was we just we set up a cluster and we said, okay, is this going to work for us? And it's, it, all the tests came back very positive. Uh, and then came the decision, okay, what do we do? Do we partner with somebody or do we actually roll it ourselves, right? There's always that, that question. And in our case, where our image data of all of the records that you're looking at at Ancestry, uh, it's kind of our bread and butter. We decided to partner with a company called SwiftStack. And SwiftStack, what they provide is they provide a controller to manage uh, Swift. They provide an automated means by installing Swift. And they provide support on top of that. So if you run into issues, they can help you out. And we felt a little more comfortable going that route than rolling it uh, ourselves. Um, so a couple things. We gave a talk in Japan, uh, in Tokyo, six months ago. And we talked, if, if you want to go look at that talk, we talked more in depth on all the Swift stuff, on hardware we're using, and, and how we're implementing it. Uh, here, we're just going to talk about a couple of things that we've done since we've come back. So when we came back from Swift, there were, there were more development teams that wanted to hop onto the object storage system and, and get their stuff in there and move off of these uh, our NAS appliances that we have in-house. And so what we did was there's a, there's a component in Swift called uh, Swift 3. Uh, and in, uh, they, in the uh, controller here, they call it the S3 emulation. This is looking at the Swift stack controller here. And so all you do is enable that. 
and it allowed our developers to use a single uh, SDK library, and it essentially turns Swift, uh, well, Swift becomes an S3 API. And so the developers only had to use a single SDK, and they were very happy about that. Before, they were writing to a Swift API and to an S3 API. So we have both, all of our images in both locations. So this shows you what it looks like. Um, this is just taken from the Swift, uh, Swift Stack uh, site, but it shows you how they map keys. So if you're familiar with um, Amazon's uh, S3, they have a concept of an access key and a secret key. And the access key is your user ID, and the secret key is your password. The, uh, how Swift Stack maps that is this Leah, uh, I think that's Leah, user there, is, becomes your access key. And this over here becomes your secret key that's circled in red. So that's the mapping there. And that's, uh, that's been really great for us, uh, simplified things for our development teams that are writing to, to object storage. So another thing that we've done is um, we still have some software, especially some scanning software that scan all these images that, um, that still require SIFs. And we've tried to get rid of SIFs as much as we can, but you, I don't know if you can completely get rid of it, right? At least, at least in our environment, we can. And so what we've done um, is we have put a Swift Stack cluster behind what they call a Veer. And a Veer is an appliance that sits in front of Swift and provides essentially a, a high-speed gateway, if you will. So it provides SIFs and NFS, ties into Active Directory. And then it's, uh, it's very good if you do a lot of writes, and it's very good if you read a lot of the same files. It may not be great if you're doing a lot of random uh, reads. So if that's something that interests either uh, viewers out there. And, uh, and right now they support only, well, they support Swift Stack, they support S3, they support Azure Blob. So they, and they, in this next slide, um, you have the ability to actually replicate, assuming that you use a veer in front of these different uh, cloud providers or Swift Stack or whoever uh, replicate between clouds, which is nice to keep your data, uh, data replicated uh, between you know, public clouds and different things like that. One kind of maybe drawback is, is that if it goes through a veer, it needs to always go through a veer and come back through a veer, right? You can't go around a veer and access that object like you, like you would, so it becomes a little bit veer specific. But it's a great use case for us. We're doing a POC with them right now, and it's been, it's been going very well. So a few things we'd like to see and that we're, we're working with SwiftStack on is um, we'd like to see kind of the, the keys that I showed you a second ago. We'd like to see those synchronized between S3 and Swift, right? I don't want to manage two sets of keys. So we'd like to see a synchronization there. We'd also like to see more private. So you have this hybrid cloud and everybody talks, you know, the, the wonders of, of private cloud. Well, it becomes kind of difficult, right? Those who, who do that and actually use public cloud because, because there's not a synchronization, synchronization tools between the object stores and different things like that. So what we're working with SwiftStack on and, and, and hopefully the community on and, and maybe we'll contribute back to the community some, something is replication between these object stores, so Azure and S3, and maybe plugins to, to make it more extensible. Because I think a lot of people may want to use the public cloud, and they may want to use their private cloud, and just to make it easier for everybody. And that's, again, the more integration is that last bullet point. Uh, and I really liked what Google is doing with uh, where they contributed back to Cinder to allow uh, to use some of their, their storage out in, out in, the G in Google Cloud uh, compute. So with that, I'm going to turn the time over to Bryce, and he's going to talk about uh, our OpenStack implementation. And then uh, I'll uh, come back, and we'll finish off with Kubernetes. So. so my name is Bryce Walter. I've been with Ancestry for five years now. Um, see, started out in their command center, knock environment, and then worked my way up to being Nova Stack Administrator, um, certified by Mirantis, and soon to be the OpenStack Foundation as well. And um, my role has been for the past few months um, building out our production OpenStack environment. So one of the main things that um, influenced um, moving from Hyper-V and building out OpenStack um, is we wanted to, to go more into a open source model versus being locked into any specific vendor. Um, we wanted a self-service portal, which Horizon provides. 
um, tighter integration between operations and development. Um, so a few months back, we actually merged some of the teams around to where we have developers working with operations. And so there's that um, multi-level knowledge. So you have the operations knowledge and the developer knowledge working side by side. And then last thing is automation. Um, we use Chef, currently use Chef um, as well as Ansible and Python, and we're moving more into the Ansible world. And that's about it for the culture. So OpenStack helps Ancestry. Um, it accelerates the time to market. Um, previously, we were submitting a VM request, and DevOps would be backlogged, and the VMs had take two or three weeks to spin up just because of the backlog that they had. Um, with OpenStack, you create the user account, user could log in, and spin up their own VM within seconds. Um, spin up a Kubernetes cluster very easily, which Jordan will talk about here in a bit. Um, as well as CoreOS machines running Docker applications and continuous integration using Jenkins. Uh, we reduce provisioning times by using cloud optimized images versus our custom um, homegrown images. Um, the size difference is about 600 megs versus 3.2 gigs. So once we got those all worked out and used the cloud images, um, provisioning times dropped down substantially. And again, the self-service portal is one of the huge needs within the company, and Horizon provides that. So in Tokyo, Jordan talked about um, our stage instance of OpenStack, which is basically a POC instance to see how it runs, understand it, learn it, um, get some of the developers in to know how to use it. And we've moved on from stage and are now in production. Um, to the questions that came up during our POC phase is if we wanted to do a vendor supported solution or if we wanted to do a vanilla slash RDO type um, installation. And we chose to install it ourselves. This way it, again, allows us to fully understand how OpenStack works. Um, some of the pain points that we've seen, um, which I'll touch base on here in a bit. Um, RabbitMQ is probably the biggest pain point that we've seen. Um, and we're still battling RabbitMQ, but it's Rabbit. Um, we only have the core OpenStack services um, running. Um, we have been testing out some of the third-party projects, um, Murano being one, um, as well as chargeback services such as Cloud Kitty. And we deployed everything through Ansible. So the components we're using are our base OS on all of our physical nodes is CentOS 7.1, uh, running RDO Kilo. Uh, we're using Mitokira as our network overlay. Uh, Glance for our image registry. Uh, Swift for our object storage. Horizon for the web UI. Nova Compute. Heat and Keystone for the authentication. Um, our current production cluster is a 77 node um, cluster, and that's a highly available cluster. Um, we have Nova Compute pointed to local disk in a RAID configuration, and we're partnered with SwiftStack and Mitakira. So this is a generalized um, overview of how our architecture is currently laid out uh, for the OpenStack environment. So again, 77 physical nodes. Um, they're Dell R630s. Um, our first rack that we got in back in January um, is dedicated for Elk as well as Kubernetes Canary slash test. 
and um, Jenkins. Uh, it consists of three high available controllers, uh, one RabbitMQ cluster, which is three nodes, one Zookeeper cluster, which is three nodes, and two Medicare gateways. Um, contains 33 compute nodes, um, 48 virtual cores, 512 gigs of RAM, and 11.4 terabytes in a RAID 5 block storage. And, and currently it's running Elk and Kubernetes stage. Um, there's a 100 node VM Elk cluster deployed within CoreOS, um, and that's Dockerized, um, which also consists of 25 Kibana and Logstash containerized VMs. And they're running on CoreOS 991.2 beta. Our second rack, which we just got in two weeks ago, um, I currently have DevStack running on it for testing, as well as OpenStack Ansible for testing. And it's a, also a 33 compute node cluster, and that consists of 40 virtual cores, 256 gigs of RAM per node, and 1.7 terabytes in a RAID 10 SSD storage array. And so down at the bottom, you see our full summary. Um, so full memory is 24.3 terabytes um, with a total of 2904 virtual CPUs and 431.8 terabytes of disk. So the deployment flow for how we've been deploying OpenStack, um, is we pixie boot the rack um, with the CentOS 7.1 image um, using Ansible. And then we kick off um, Python scripts that Jordan created for setting up the RAID configuration for the Dell iDRAX. Um, we run, or we created our own Ansible playbooks, and this was before OpenStack Ansible was announced. And so we already had them in place. Um, we run a customized bash script to add our physical host into the MetoNet tunnel zone. Um, otherwise, you'd have to manually enter each host one by one through the MetoNet CLI. And using the bash script, it allows you to um, inject the list of IPs of the physical host and add them in all at once. And then we do functional testing using Rally, and then start all the OpenStack services. So this is a high-level overview of how our MetoNet, or how MetoNet is laid out. Um, this is taken from the MetoNet site. So those who aren't familiar with MetoNet can get a generalized overview on how things work. Um, MetoNet also provides a web UI, so you can actually see um, graphical data. You can set up load balancers within the web UI, um, VTAPs, your tunnel zones, all of your hosts that are connected, which ports are connected to, as well as set up your BGP routing. So one of the first um, issues you ran into with RabbitMQ um, it was when we first deployed our L cluster, it was a 100 node um, test cluster with co running CoreOS. And um, RabbitMQ actually stalled out and it crashed the environment after six minutes of hang time. And we realized that our DNS entries weren't fully populated and RabbitMQ um, pretty much spun up the ERLang or ERLang um, processes and flooded itself out. So once we reset all the configuration for RabbitMQ, rebuilt the entire RabbitMQ cluster, um, we did the second test and we had 75 elk VMs um, deploy in less than 20 seconds. And that was from time to launch to time to log in. So some of the lessons we learned, um, RabbitMQ has to be on physical hardware. 
it can run into VM, but you're just going to run into resource issues. Um, file descriptors is going to be a big, the, the biggest one. Um, the Erlang database needs to be on either SSDs or a fast object store. Um, otherwise, you're going to hit your read writes, and it will, again, cause you issues. Uh, the file descriptors need to be at least 65K. Um, be on at least the latest version of Rabbit or a recommended version from um, the OpenStack documentation. Ensure the BGP tunnel zones are up before adding your hosts into the tunnel. Um, this is one of the issues we hit whenever we um, first added our routes into Metonet. Um, the tunnels weren't up yet, and so when we added our hosts, none of them were responding. Ensure DNS is fully resolved to um, the fully qualified domain. Um, we use a hardware appliance for our DNS management, and some of the DNS entries weren't populated through all of the zones, and that was one of the biggest pain points that we had was making sure that DNS was fully configured and stable. Ensure all the configs match between each of your services. Um, with our stage environment running um, Juno and production running Kilo, the configs are a lot different. And that was the very first thing that we had noticed when we started our services, that none of the configs matched up to what they were supposed to be. And so we rewrote all the configs and created a base template for each service. And then when we deploy with Ansible, we have a shell script that will populate each of the required values. And recently, we noticed a bug with um, CoreOS on OpenStack um, when you're using a config drive. Um, it doesn't populate the private and public IP for Flannel, as well as the etcd2 um, configuration. And we have a workaround that we're running for that to where it will read the EC2 metadata and populate it into the environment variables. And on that, I will hand it back to Jordan to go over our Kubernetes deployment. Great. <clears throat> Good job, Bryce. <clears throat> All right, thanks, Bryce. Appreciate it. So <clears throat> one thing we're doing a little differently <clears throat> in at Ancestry is uh, who deploys CoreOS today? Nope, really. Uh, one, a couple, OK. So we, <clears throat> we actually, um, so we obviously don't run OpenStack on CoreOS. <clears throat> Excuse me, uh, but we run pretty much every. We've kind of standardized on everything going forward, is is in CoreOS, and why? Uh, a few reasons why. It's it's very lightweight, so it's kernel, systemd, um, Docker, and um, there's a few others. Uh, SSH, right? There's a few other components. Other than that, you're responsible for running everything else in in Docker containers. And so there was about a year ago, <clears throat> our execs and, and kind of the, the whole organization said, we're going to do this shift to containerization. So what better OS, right, to go to containerization than one that kind of forces you to go to containerization. Uh, so we wanted to get out of the RPM install. OK, this package, it's, it's easy. People are familiar with it. But this, this kind of forces everyone to move to Docker containers. And it's been, it's been great. The security is great. We have no vulnerabilities. Uh, their their um, motto is, is to secure the internet. And when we really like that. And the security guys really like that. And then the updates are great. So we're on, we're on the 4.3 kernel. And we always feel like if you're running Docker you sh that relies on the kernel, you should probably have a newer kernel. We actually have been, run into a lot of issues <clears throat> with older kernel, kernels biting us with Docker and just bugs we've run into. So, and then there's an update mechanism, which they're updating all the time. They update one partition, they update another, and they reboot, and you come up with a new image. And it gets you out of, and I'm not against CentOS or anything by that means, uh, but it gets you out of this managing these repos and RPMs and kind of dependency, dependency issues you run into. It's really nice. So this, this just quickly shows you, so CoreOS has a concept of a cloud config, where you feed that to the operating system. 
<coughs> and the, it, it configures your system for you. So if you need to configure etcd, which is a distributed key value store, you <coughs> create a cloud config like this, say Nova boot, <coughs> pass it in that uh, cloud config right there, that YAML file, and then your other Nova op options, and that will spin up uh, an etcd, this will be one node in your SCD cluster. You'd have to do this two other times, and then it's that simple to have an SCD cluster, and you're on your way to a Kubernetes deployment within OpenStack, or, or Amazon has the same concept as well. So quickly, um, <clears throat> you might have seen this slide before. It's common on the, on the Kubernetes documentation, but our architecture is three SCD nodes. Um, we point SCD to faster disks, uh, two API servers, uh, that run, each one of those run an API server with an F5 load balancing across those, so if we you know, lose one, it'll still go to the other one. And then the scheduler and the controller manager, uh, which schedule pods, and then the controller manager, which keeps state in the Kubernetes cluster, it can only run on one or the other, and so it'll, you know, depending on what node, master node it'll be on. And then you have kube control, <clears throat> which will actually, you know, you send commands via kube control, and that will spin up your replication controllers and create your services, and you know, that's how you manage it, essentially, the, the cluster. And then you have the concept of nodes, that's where your containers or pods run, and that has the kubelet, that's responsible for starting your containers, for sending events to the API, doing a number of things. And then the proxy service here, kube proxy, is a service for load balancing, if you will, um, your pods in the cluster. And I'll talk more about that here in just a second. <clears throat> so this is kind of high level. I'm gonna try to get into the weeds a little bit now on, <clears throat> excuse me guys, on how we're deploying and the networking and the monitoring and the upgrades. And those are the things I hope that, that interest you. Uh, that's what I put into the slide, because I think that's, if you're operating something like this, those, those are things that always comes up. So how are we deploying this today? This is in no particular order, because I might get tomatoes thrown at me from a, uh, at an OpenStack summit. Uh, Amazon, uh, I should have put it OpenStack first there, but. So we do deploy to Amazon as kind of our DR. That's our DR facility right now. Uh, it deploys fine in Amazon. We deploy into um, Amazon. Some of the nice things there is there a little bit better integration with Kubernetes. Um, we deploy our dev environment into OpenStack, so all of our testing, everything that's done in Kubernetes is done in OpenStack. We just, since I got here to the conference, we just upgraded from 117 to 122. We did that while I was here, or the team did that while I was here, and it went great. So. <clears throat> And then bare metal, we have our stage and our production environments on bare metal. And the reason they're on bare metal is two things. One is we don't have the overhead of a hypervisor. And the other one is we only have a single overlay. If you run Kubernetes with CoreOS and Flannel in Amazon or OpenStack, you have an overlay within an overlay, right? It's not, I don't know if it's a major concern, but it's something that we're, we're still investigating and want to see what that performance hit really is uh, in OpenStack and Amazon, or any cloud for that matter. So, so okay, networking. This, is a, this was a one that I think was probably the trickiest for us. I, I'm not sure why looking back. So this was a, a diagram um, one of our network guys put together. He's pretty good at OmniGraph, so I, he, he sent that over to me. So what we were doing was, you can see each of the minion or nodes have an IP address of say 10, 125, 34, 14, 15, 16. So what we were actually doing, <clears throat> and you can see, sorry that's hard to see, but in this right above, I, can, I got a pointer here, right there, we were actually adding physical routes. So, so, so let me back up just a little bit. So how Kubernetes works is you, you post a slash 16 subnet to flannel. Then when Docker loads with Flannel, actually Flannel loads Docker, it goes out to etcd and says, what slash 24 subnet can I assign to this minion? And then what we were doing, as you can see here, we were actually adding physical routes so that you could reach your pod IPs from your desk, right? So you could actually ping them and hit them. Uh, Kelsey Hightower from Google did a did a, uh, a demonstration where, so this is a valid configuration, but did a valid, uh, 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 where he load balanced pod IPs with Nginx. And so they had to be routable to do that, and that's, and so this is, 
we don't do it this way anymore, but this works. And it didn't really buy us anything. And what made it a real pain and the reason we went away from it was we, every time we added, oh, shoot. That's not what I meant to do. <laughs> there, sorry. Every time we added a minion, um, we would have to add a new entry into the routing table, right, into the physical route. And then it, it made, and OpenStack and Amazon made it even worse because <clears throat> You'd have to do a route in the routing table physical. You'd have to do a route in the Metonet provider router. Then you'd have to do a route in the tenant router. And so we were doing all these routes, and then we finally got, okay, there's got to be a better way to do this. And essentially, there is a better way to do this, and this is a diagram from CoreOS, is you really, you don't, you don't have to make the pod IPs routable at all. So the pod IPs can be like a 172, 168, 192, or sorry, 172, 16, 192, 168 because there's an overlay with flannel there and it knows how to take care and pass traffic between the pods either via UDP and CAP, which we're not using, but we're using, or VXLAN and that's what we're using today. So it knows how to pass traffic. And so it made it a lot easier. We don't have to deal with routes and all this different, uh, all these just different things that we were doing before uh, made our life a lot easier. And then um, developers still have to create a service no matter what. And, they, and we access those services via node port, which I think is fairly common. Um, I don't think everybody's all in Kubernetes using the cluster IP uh, that gets assigned when you create a service at this point. So usually it's a node port. So I'll, and I'll show you just a quick example of that. I gave this, this slide in Tokyo, but this shows on the left one of our, this is an example of one of our apps, a replication controller here on the left. And what I kind of want to focus on is, is more the node port right here. So <clears throat> when you create a service in Kubernetes via this node port piece right here, you can have it assign a high port right there, right? And so to then access your service, you hit a minion IP on that high port, and that takes you via kube proxy to your, to your service or to your app within the Kubernetes cluster. I'm, I'm probably preaching to the choir. You guys probably know that already, but uh, just a quick example, okay? And if that doesn't make sense, come up and talk to us, and we're at the, the booth here on Thursday, too. You can stop by, and we can walk you through some of this, too. So, um, so monitoring. So early on in the Kubernetes Slack channel, if you're not on the Kubernetes Slack channel, I'd highly recommend it. It's fantastic. Um, I asked a guy on there and said, so what monitoring do you use for Kubernetes? And he said, oh, you don't need monitoring for Kubernetes. And I'm like, what? And I, I, I actually believed him for a, a, a few hours. So. <laughs> And then I went back and talked to the team, and it's like, no, that's really, that's really crazy. So, so Kubernetes has a concept of, uh, you can, it's an add-on. You can deploy it to the cluster. It's called Heapster. And Heapster, what Heapster does is it goes out, and it, it aggregates all of the metrics from C-Advisor. And C-Advisor is called Container Advisor. It's from Google. It's part of the Kubelet in, in CoreOS. And, and it will, all it does is sit there and it presents metrics. And so Heapster goes and grabs those metrics and it continues to grab them, aggregates them. And then you can do a bunch of things with them. You can send them to Influx. You could send them, I don't know, wherever you want, any time series database that's supported by Heapster. And then so what we do is we deploy Heapster and Kubedash into a single pod, right? You've heard of multiple containers per pod. Good example of that is this. And then you have. This isn't a great monitoring, right? This isn't like monitoring and alerting, but this is really nice to quickly hop in and see, okay, what's the overall cluster doing? What's CPU, what's RAM? This is actually a screenshot from one of our, like our dev cluster or something like that. So what, the, what we're using for real monitoring this, uh, is Prometheus. Um, if you haven't heard of Prometheus, I highly recommend looking at that. You can definitely go buy a solution. This is completely free. It was written by two guys that left Google that started SoundCloud. And it's written in Go, so it's fast. It has its own uh, time series database. It's open source, that's great. And it's a poll-based approach. And we could probably have a whole discussion for an hour on people polling or pushing, right? There's, there was a lot of debate in our, in our organization, on, in our team on that. But it's a poll-based, which, which I actually agree with. And Grafana can integrate with the Prometheus time series database. So you can get all the goodness of Grafana there. Okay. And then they have the, the concept, so this is just the architecture of it. I'm going to run out of time here. Um, but it, the concept is you have Prometheus server that we run in a container, do a volume mount to store that data, um, the time series database. 
we use instead of prom dash, which is the dashboard, we use uh, Grafana. And then there's these scrapers that go out and you can figure these scrapers to go and pull all this information in and then you can display that within Grafana. That's the simplest way. But the great part is there's tie into Kubernetes so you can point it to the, a scraper to the API and it'll scrape all the stuff and metrics from Kubernetes and present it back in. So it's really, if you haven't looked at it and you don't want to pay for a monitoring solution, this is a great, uh, this is a great way to go. Um, let's see, so upgrades. Um, I'm actually, I'm gonna actually skip over that. Um, and, and if you want to talk about upgrades, we can talk about after or come to the booth because a couple slides I really want to show you here at the end. Uh, so I wanted to show you, I am not an OmniGraffle expert, as you can tell. My colleague Al, who did the networking, was much, uh, was much nicer than this one. But anyway, you have, here's our process flow, which I wanted to show. Uh, you have a developer up there, and I think that looks like most of our laptops, right? Most of us. So w the process today is you log into OpenStack Horizon, you make sure your code's in Git or whatever repo that you're using. You, we, the process for us is we spin up a CoreOS box, we have a Jenkins server, uh, or a Jenkins uh, image, sorry, uh, that is, we pull down from Quay.io, that's our internal Docker registry, or sorry, not Docker registry, but uh, image registry, I guess. Pull that down, run that on CoreOS, and then the great thing about Jenkins is it can look at Git and see if your code has changed. If it changes, it pushes that new change to Quay, updates the image, right, in the, in the repo. And then what's even more great about it is it can push your image on the back end to Swift and S3, right, so you can have it offsite. And then what we do is the developers have a build job that they run and simply deploy to dev stage. And we're working on a process so they can't just deploy to live because we don't want to just live all the time. That gets a little scary. But we're working on a process where we can, uh, you know, maybe hold it, I don't want to hold them back too much, but enough to where we can get some, a little bit of change management uh, there. But that's how we're doing it and it's a fantastic process. And this is um, really why we're doing Kubernetes, right? Because people are like, oh, it's cool technology. Deployment times have gone from 40 minutes to five minutes with the new CI CD pipeline that we have in Kubernetes. The other thing is before, what would happen is they'd put a request for a VM. If they wanted to scale things up, a request for a VM, it would go through the process like Bryce talked about. And then, and then they'd finally get it and then a week later they, would, they could scale up the app, right? Well, that's, not very, that's not great scaling. So what we can do now in Kubernetes is you just run a scale and boom, you have, you, I'll, I'll actually show you a demo here, we have to do a couple of minutes. And then the rolling upgrades where you can have a new image or a new RC that you present to Kubernetes and it'll do a rolling, kind of a rolling update. It'll take these pods down, bring these pods up and the next thing you know, your app is updated within just minutes. So let me show you this quick, um, this quick demo, if this works. This may not, oh, this may not work. It's not letting me play it, let's see. Let me see if I can do a different view, sorry. You know, even a recorded demo's not working, that's even worse. <laughs> Sheesh. So anyway, <clears throat> we won't, uh, maybe we won't do the demo today, but what I was gonna show you is, um, is this has us run a cube control command and I'll just, I'll just walk you through real quick. So it does a kube control. I had a hello world uh, container running in Kubernetes and it had one replica. And I did a kube control scale dash dash replicas equals, like it was at one, I went five. And within a, just a matter of seconds, it had spun up five additional replicas. And that's what our devs like, is if they're seeing a little extra load on the system, they can, and assuming that we have capacity underneath, either on OpenStack or bare metal, we can, they can scale just extremely easily. So anyway, I hope that was beneficial. Um, we, I, I thought we, we just wanted to show you like kind of the nitty gritty of what we're doing and I uh, hope you can take some of that back and, and apply that to your environments. And Kubernetes, I, I haven't used Mesos, but man, Kubernetes is, it is amazing. It's, it's very, very great. So thank you. And if, if we have maybe a minute or two for questions, we can do that too. So.
you want to come to the, the mic? So, yeah, I mean, I think we just want, so his question was, why do you want to slow developers down, maybe going to prod, is that right? So I think, I think it's not so much slowing them down, I think it's just tracking that there's a role, so that if a site issue occurs, we can kind of tie it back maybe to that role. So, yeah, sure. Anybody else? Yep. So we have uh, supporting, oh, so this is both OpenStack and Kubernetes. We have a team of? Nine. Nine? So, yep. And it's, we're feeling, uh, we're, we, we're feeling it a little bit there, like it's a lot to support, and so we hope that we can add some more resources to that, to that team, so. Anybody else? Uh, they're configured this, exactly the same, um, and we haven't ran into that yet. There, there could be a, uh, a chance for that, though. Yeah, good question. Yeah. If there's any more, I think we're out of time, but come and you're welcome to come chat with us, or we're, again, we're at the booth on Thursday uh, over the Kubernetes booth, so thanks, you guys. Appreciate it.